four, three, two, one. Ah, oh, and we're here, back at Preston Raspberry Jam. I think this is the fifth one we've had. We've had July, September, October, and this the fifth one on the 5th of November. July, August, September, October. Uh. <laughs> Now these, so these raspberry jam things, they're quite, they're quite young, really. The, the, I think we had one in June in Manchester, so they've only been going for six months. But already we're taking over the world, and um, and it started in Preston. So anyway, we, we we keep trying different things, and we've had a lot of ones where uh, people come along and talk. Have you noticed actually? I haven't done any presentations at any of the Preston raspberry jams. Have you noticed? That? <coughs> yeah, you're probably lucky that I haven't. But um, I'm just kind of this person who comes along and I, I get Martin to do all the, the donkey work. So he, he, he twitch, turns on the video camera. He makes sure that we've all got Wi-Fi passwords. And all we get to people come along and talk about stuff. And it's great because I don't have to do anything apart from just turn up, make sure I get the right room and that sort of thing. So tonight we've got Kevin and we'll... we'll Hello, Simon. <laughs> Sorry. And mate. we'll find out a little bit about why Kevin's here in a moment. And, do, do, Kevin, do people struggle quite often saying your name, do you think? Do you, yes, and yeah. it makes no difference to me. I don't even hear it. When people get right. it right or wrong, honestly. Yeah. Oh, I sh changed it. Oh, we did shrinking it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. So, what I'd like to do tonight is start off, find out what news we know about. Because I wasn't actually at the last one. I missed the last one. I had lots of different things happening. But since the last month or two, what, what, what's happened? What's going on? What, what have people heard about? So I st I'll start off with one, and then you can follow. So, uh, just last night, we've announced we're going to have a, a jamboree in Manchester in March, on the 9th of March. It's a Saturday. So the way that this is going to work is there's a huge big conference centre in Manchester called Manchester Central. It used to be the GMEX. And I heard that there was going to be an education innovation conference there. There's something that teachers go to sometimes called BET. You might have heard of this big show down in London where they, you know, people like Microsoft get to say, hey, look at this software, and this is really good, and, and, and that sort of thing. So there, there's somebody who organised a conference like this up in Manchester. And when I heard about this, I thought, well, we, we, we need to sort of figure Raspberry Jam into that in some way. So they've given us a space in this huge, big conference centre. There's a two-day education conference going on. There's all sorts of people you may have heard of, like Emma McQueen, Hub Mom. She's a lady who runs Young Rewired State. She's coming up. Stephen Twig, he's the Shadow Secretary for Education, so he'll be there. Uh, there's all sorts of such a famous people in education. I know some of you are not in education. It might not mean anything to you. But on the Saturday, we've got a, a space like this, but it's, but it's big enough to get 340 people in. And we've got lots of people who are going to come along and do talks. We've got two people from the foundation coming. So we have Pete Lomas. Pete Lomas, you may have heard of his name. He's the guy who basically had to try and take um, the Raspberry Pi that was like this size and squeeze it down to something that was credit card size. That's, that's what he's ended up doing. And we also have Rob Bishop. He's like the evangelist that goes around now. He's, he's been doing all the make affairs in the States. He's going around. We've also got famous author coming along called Simon, who's just had a book published. <laughs> <laughs> How to program your, well, programming the Raspberry Pi in Python. <gasps> That's the first copy I've seen so far. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah. From Preston as well, it all happens in Preston. It does. So, we'll have lots of people coming along. But, some of you might be wondering about whether it's the kind of event you go along to, because it's got... It's got two aims, but the first aim really is that this Raspberry Pi computer is supposed to help children coding and think about computing and programming it. And it's great that some of you, you know, you've been using Linux for years and, and building your own computer systems. And that's great that you warm to the Raspberry Pi, but the, the real point of the Raspberry Pi is it's supposed to be for the next generation. When I look around this room and I see at the moment that there's not many people, there's just around about the 20, around about 25, there's a couple of people. Hello? Hi. Gosh, Neil. Is this your first Raspberry Jam, Neil? It is, yeah. Oh, gosh. So, I'm just saying, looking around the room, you look at the age demographic, 
Just my own name. We now have one female in the room, and, and sometimes we manage three or four. Uh, but, but let's be honest, if, 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 if we can't do something, yeah, you're in the right place, come on, come in. Yeah? I usually bring two females themselves. Yes, that's right. Yeah. They're both at the yeah, fireworks. Too shy to come in. No, no, no. <laughs> but anyway, the, so the point is, the, the whole point of the Raspberry Pi is, it, it's really for the next generation. And some people in education, I was at a, a, a great event that Dawn organised on Saturday. And Carl, Raspberry Jam on the Edge. I love that name, that Edge Hill. And there's loads of teachers there, and a lot of the teachers going, it's great, I loved all the excitement and the buzz and all this kind of thing, but how am I going to use this in my classroom? Because I've already got computers, why would I want a Raspberry Pi? And the point of this conference is, this jamboree, is to try and help so that teachers can come along, or people who are interested in education, can come along and go, I get it now, ah, right, I'm starting to see. And, and it's a pretty tall task, but that's what we're planning for the Saturday night of March. If, if, you, if you're interested in education and you want to come along and support us, I'd love for you to come along. It's going to be a full day event and we're going to have loads of great stuff that happens on that day. So that's one bit of news. Now, somebody else, tell us a bit of news about the Raspberry Pi. Come on. Oh, I know what we're waiting for. Beep, 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 News flash. Come on. So, somebody tell me something. Memory. What about memory? Yeah, new, new Raspberry Pis with uh, double memory. And how do you get one of them? You go to CPC, but except they've sold out, so you wait for a few week or so and then you go to CPC. <laughs> yeah. I was in CPC today and uh, I got talking to the MD and he was saying, it's great, we, just, we get a load and then we go and we get a load and we go. People are saying, um, you can't get hold of these things, but if you keep going to CPC, you can get hold they of ring, them. They ring you up. If you order one and one's not coming, they do ring you up. They'll deliver it. Is that yeah. They'll right? deliver it as well. Yeah. They'll come to your house with a great big van and deliver it. Credit card. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they'll even carry it to your house for you if you want, like Waitrose. Yeah. Um, pretty delivery. You could be very crafty and you could do what one of our jambassadors, okay, what one of our jambassadors has done, the Atari t shirt. He sold his Raspberry Pi on eBay to buy another one. So he sold it for £32. And then bought the new one with it. So he's upgraded his memory and he's got seven pounds left over yeah, as well. His old one will be a collector's item. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the person who bought it is actually got a good deal. <laughs> what about Riscos? Somebody mentioned Riscos before. What's happening there? Has an image come out today, I think, from the foundation? So there's a new image where you can run Riscos on your Raspberry Pi. Why would you want to run Riscos on a Raspberry Pi? Because it's. Uh, Where's it down? <laughs> come on, RI stands for. Reduced. Reduced. Oh, like, <laughs> come on, class. Reduced instruction set. Because there's less instruction for the code with it, runs a lot faster. It, like, blisteringly fast. It's announced in November's Magpie. Okay. I was just looking at it before I came out tonight. And Magpie is the magazine that you've not heard for of. You can, you can buy it, you can subscribe to it. They were, I thought they were going to send me some issues, but because they, they just had too many issues printed, but they didn't. But anyway, so Magpie magazine, November, to yeah. find out That's about the Riscos thing. And there was, a, there was a Rugal event in London Saturday, last, not last Saturday, but before that, and Evan was there and getting all excited about Riscos. Um, Silicon Valley, have you heard what's happening in Silicon Valley? <laughs> well, okay, you heard it here first. We're possibly going to have the biggest Raspberry Jam on the planet in March in Silicon Valley. Two and a half thousand people expected to turn up. I'll tell you a little bit more about that another time. Uh, but that's going to be big. And cases, tell us about a case, come on. Hello! They're about six pounds of CPC. And they come in only one colour? Yeah. Pink. 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 <laughs> Is this just turning into a CPC advert? Strawberry <laughs> 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 gone from oh, five, five years to get the end. Uh, no, no, uh, I brought it with me last time, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have also got a 3D printed case. They have the um, oh, starter packs. Yeah. Yes, now mm. Maplins have also been selling starter packs so you can get the power supply and the cables and the keyboard and all sorts of stuff for. I think. 
I think the pitch is about seventy-five pounds for the for the like altogether. Forty quid or something. Let's see if you can see though, isn't it? For a similar thing. Is there any word on green foot? Somebody was a little birdie was telling yeah. me that green was going to be a green foot type thing yeah. for the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I'm I'm the wrong person to know about okay. this. But from cobbling it together from the other people in the office that are doing it, so we got our five twelve Raspberry Pi about a week or two ago, and so our trusty PhD student put green foot on it, and he tells me it runs. Uh, it's noticeably different on the, the 512 than it was in the 256. He says it runs reasonably well, and what we're still waiting on is uh, Oracle are doing a JDK with hard floating point support, which means it uses the floating point that's actually on the processor, whereas up until now it's been using soft software floating point, which but means there software there isn't any hardware floating point in the project. There is. 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 There is Sort of reasonably nicely um, on the on the pie. So we have got it running. Um, I think we had to tweak a couple of options here and there, but yeah, it's looking good. So Neil Brown is from the University of Kent. Um, he is working in the development of a software uh, tool, programming tool called Greenfoot, which is like a almost like the Riscos version of Java. It's reduced instructions. So, so if that's successful, we won't just have. Python and Scratch available on the Raspberry Pi. We'll also have Greenfoot, which is modelled on Java. Right. Any more news, news before we move on to why we're really here? Okay. Go on. You going to tell me something? No. Overclocking is, is fairly recent. I don't know if it's since the last meeting, but it's a uh, part of Raspberry Pi. So, so we got so up to two gigahertz. Is that right? Really? No. I, I heard no, so no. we got two gigahertz. <laughs> Supposed to be cool yeah. enough, maybe. <laughs> Or with a two megahertz. <laughs> and then two what melted? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it two megahertz. Is it one megahertz? No, no, it's one gig. It'll go to one gig, I think. What's one gig supported? Yes, exactly. Right. No, well, then that definitely read somebody's going to do gig. Yeah, yeah. Right. Which means one gig without any cooling on as well. Yeah. So maybe. <laughs> maybe this time of the year it, it, it will run a bit Let's get the 25 quid computer and the 300 quid cooling. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it could be relevant for projects like Greenfoot, which are, are quite demanding on the. Yeah. We have the teacher in the back, be quiet, please. Sorry, sir. Gentlemen, we're all kind of open source the chip support. Yes. yes. The source code for the CPU has now been open sourced. And somebody the, graphic, the graphics now has been open sourced. Yeah. yeah, the GPU. Yeah. So somebody came. Yeah, I'll see your idea. I was thinking the about the if it's okay basically putting something on the website, like a wiki, and calling it possibly mapping the pie. And we map the hardware registers. And do it as a global sort of thing. So, because the documentation obviously isn't going to come out anytime soon. So, I think it'll have to be just reverse engineered. But now we've got the source code, that's a really good head start. Um, instead of using words, we use the, the register addresses. You know. Is, is there some people sat in the room thinking, I haven't got a clue what he's yeah. talking about? Basically, yeah. the, the fastest way of using the Raspberry Pi, the, the best way so it'll be done, is to map it properly. Then, so you, you address the hardware directly rather than using an operating system. If the, ras the Raspberry Pi was a book of spells and didn't know how to use the spells and somebody went through yeah. and figured out where all the spells were and which pages they were on. All of the classic 8 bits have like yeah. a mapping sort of book, so you'd have like mapping the Commodore 64 and have the, the, the hardware reference manual for them. And it means and you can truly hack. Cause yeah, you can do some really good tricks with it. So we, the best way of getting the best speed out of it is to actually map it in hardware. Circuit diagrams have been released. Yeah. News is coming in right now. Uh, so circuit diagrams for Raspberry Pi have been released. So anyone that's interested, very high resolution PDF. That's the build you wrong. Without the CP. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, they, just, they just released the circuit diagram so you can see what's on it if you want to monitor right. or anything. So it's a, it's a download from the website now. Yeah. Right. The, the GPU that source code really. Major thing, you know, as well. 
that was from our frontline correspondent. We're, well, we're probably going to have the, 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 we're going to have a jam in December, but we're thinking of just making it more of a social rather than a business type thing where people are doing things. Then in, in January we're going to have one in a school. There's some more people coming in. And in February we're going to have one in a school. <laughs> News to follow soon. Hello. Now we'll introduce tonight's guest. Well, he's not. He probably doesn't need to introduce because lots of you have met him before. <laughs> so Kevin Hoyle. You're dead. He's, he's okay. doing a PhD at Lancaster the University at the moment, and he's, he's done lots of things that I've seen. He's come in and supported lots of things in our school to do with around Arduinos. Simon Monk has previously presented all about Arduino and Arduino with Raspberry Pi and Interface Me Two, and we've got our first proper hands-on session tonight. January will also be a hands-on session. Time for Alan to shut up and Kevin to take over. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Hello everyone. Wow, I hadn't expected quite so many people, but thank you, that's great. Um, that's assuming you knew what was happening tonight. Um, um, so, I'm very aware that there's a whole spread of expertise in the room, um, and I'd like to get some kind of idea about that. And what I'm going to be talking about is microcontroller programming attaching to a Raspberry Pi. Anyone in the room know what the Raspberry Pi is? No? Ah, okay, Simon. <laughs> the guy that wants to put it, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the ways in which you can use some other established open source or open hardware um, technology based on Arduino uh, in order to connect to the outside world with your Raspberry Pi. Um, and so I'm going to try and get a map of what people know and what people's expertise is <laughs> around that subject. So, um, uh, who here you has used Linux yet? Okay, well, some people. So some people haven't booted their Raspberry Pi yet, maybe. Or do you not? Uh, are you not familiar with risk ops Maybe. Yeah, could be. Could be. There's, there's plenty of other. <laughs> plenty of other choices. Flavors for your Raspberry. I suppose. Um, so, and in terms of Arduino, who has uh, created or, or, or uh, experimented with an Arduino project, <coughs> done something with Arduino? Okay, this reasonable representation. I've got to cover that a little bit. Um, and uh, um, so, just trying to think. Uh, Oh yeah, well, in terms of actual programming, so many people kind of you use instructions on existing projects, and that's exactly how you should start out. Um, so who's written code uh, in support of one of their projects yet? Uh, make a programming noise. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, right. So there's a spread of skills here. I'll try and make sure that I describe the how and the why, and the aim today is to show you practice. That is to say, rather than showing you glorified, fancy end results of things where all the steps are hidden, I'm going to try and show you the ways that I get there, the ways that I got there, and some of the ways that you can get there. Uh, we're also, hopefully, going to be building some uh, small computers. And the rough model I have for this is, I'll hand them all out, anybody who wants to make one can make one, uh, and if you don't want to take it away with, with you, Sorry, if you want to take it away with you, then uh, if you could pay me for the components, then I'm not out of pocket. Uh, but if you don't want to take it away with, with you, just give it back to me at the end and I'll recycle all the components and you don't have to pay a thing. So that's fine. Okay. So we will get to that. So it's a packed hour and a half, I think, we've got something like that. So, so you're going to explain shortly, aren't you, why we're doing this and what's the point of it? I will. Yeah. That's where, where we're going. So, uh, let me just keep this page. Um, okay, so, the context for all of this is Alan. It's Alan's fault, as usual. Um, so, he invited me to an event at Our Lady, which is Alan's school. And it was about technology access for the kids. So, creating a, a context for them to encounter technology and figure out how they could make something with technology, and maybe how easy it is or how hard it is. All of those, those things, just an encounter. And so a lot of different people were invited. Uh, and I showed up, and there was a box of these things, Arduinos, uh, which is a box that tends to get 
handed out at the start of the class and hoovered back in at the end. And the reason for that is that it's kind of expensive for a school to issue one every class, honestly. Um, so I figured it might be possible, based on what I gathered myself at that stage, I hadn't really done it yet, but I figured it might be possible to find a way to change that cost dynamic, make it possible for any school to issue uh, a, a, basically an Arduino to a kid and not have to worry about it on budget, uh, for budget reasons. Um, and also, the skills that you tend to pick up along the way um, are quite authentic prototyping skills. So you tend to be building a circuit on a prototyping board like this, a solderless prototyping board, and then you might move on to uh, soldering the same circuit onto strip board where it's got copper on the back and you melt the solder to connect the, the uh, pins. Um, and then you might build a, an actual project of some kind. This is a Simon memory game that beeps and flashes. Um, and uh, so, the aim is to, to try and kind of create that, that, that experience as cheaply as possible in schools. That's where we started. Um, and so it's very much, very similar to the Raspberry Pi initiative in terms of how can we get kids uh, to, to, to have access to that stuff uh, in the best possible way. But a different direction. So, does that answer your question, Alan, at the back? Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> so, this is a, a set of slides that I gave. In my victory tour, which wasn't really that much of a victory tour, it was total chaos again. Um, going back to Our Lady after learning a year, trying to figure out exactly what would uh, be right for them. And so the model of what we're doing here is, is mind control. It's about taking a little bit of your brain and putting it inside of an object. Being able to control things at a distance. You know, and this is a, a famous mind control machine. This is, in some ways, the most famous mind control machine. Um, it's proven at 122 times the distance uh, to the sun. This is Voyager spacecraft programmed uh, in the 50s, or uh, I think it's the 50s, I guess, um, and sent out beyond the, the sun uh, and way, way beyond the sun. And it's still under the control of the mind of the person that programmed it way back when. And so what they had to figure out was the language, the terms in which you can explain to a machine how to behave and to put a little bit of their brain into it. So, um, the model that we've got of that kind of system is basically sensor inputs, there's some kind of uh, brain munging going on, and then motor outputs. Um, and as you can see in Simon Monk's book, Breaking News, he talks about the Arduino and the Pi. So the Pi is a, 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 a mode of technology access that we already know, know about for kids. Um, so, um, Arduino boards are much more rugged and designed to be used to control electronic devices. Uh, they have analog inputs that can measure a voltage from, say, a temperature sensor. What can you tell us about that? Uh, well, I've got one here and it works in about or less than two pounds worth of components, or two components on the board here, that will be, be temperature to the nearest tenth of a degree Celsius. Okay, um, so what have you got there, just if you could describe it? Uh, well, As people can see around. Um, we have a shrimp board on the breadboard connected to a Raspberry Pi. And Raspberry Pi is running a web server talking to the shrimp board. The shrimp board is reading the temperature of the, te of the temperature sensor. And that's pretty much it so far. It's a prototype and building for something much bigger in the end. And, and the, the, the key word that pricked my ears was brewery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might not be yeah. relevant to other people, but well, yeah, well, that's a beginning, beginning prototype of a very fermenter controller and a hot water tank controller to the nearest tenth of a degree. Great. So okay. That's the beginnings of it, anyway. So um, that, that's an example of, of how you can, you know, maybe afford to experiment with some uh, some different kinds of control and create your own devices to do something that you want. Now, the, the uh, Raspberry Pi, as you as you may know, um, <clears throat> has these pins on it, uh, known, known as the GPIO pins, um, which you can buy from a shop if you want. Some uh, adapters of various kinds. This is just one um, that you can then. Um, used to uh, attach, uh, hang on a minute, 
thing. Um, you can use to uh, attach um, to the pins and then use them for input and output. That's what general purpose I.O. stands for, GPIO. Um, but, as uh, Simon points out, they're not really robust. They're not designed to be exposed to kind of... Um, uh, how would you describe it, Simon? Um, well, they're delicate, basically. I mean, the, on, a, on an Arduino one of, or a shrimp kit, it, you know, the actual microprocessor chip itself is separate, and it's a dual-in-line plug-in chip. And if you if you damage it or destroy it, you can just whip it out. And yeah, plus it's disposable. One. I mean, they're rugged to three, begin with. Three or four quid. Yeah. But um, if you do the same trick with your Raspberry Pi, that's it, you killed your Raspberry Pi. You're not going to be able to. Absolutely. So um, here's... Yeah. Sorry. So, so there's a pitch here that I've made before, and no, I'm not making any money from this, so I'll explain that in a bit more. <laughs> but, um, so you have uh, potential to replace a £16 Arduino board, which does give you that kind of option of controlling stuff with your RSP Pi or with anything else, or just with the Arduino, because it is a computer in its own right. You can write behaviours, or, or give the Arduino behaviours itself, just to run on its own, run on battery, and that's fine. Yeah, the, other, the key difference I can pick up is the timing characteristics. The Arduinos can do real-time stuff on it and be utterly predictable as to the timing. But on a Raspberry Pi, uh, you'd be potentially the operating system in the way of stealing time from you. Right. So that's so another key difference. So if you're wanting to time a bullet and set up a flash that captures a balloon exploding to get the perfect photograph, you might be looking more at Arduino than Raspberry Pi. I guess. Um, so yeah, so for about 16 quid you get an Arduino, and that looks like this, and it's got a bunch of things in it, including this section here, which is for USB connectivity, and to be able to talk to the chip and program it, and also to talk to it if that's part of its function. In other words, if you want to attach it to a computer, and then have this external, this, this sort of portal into the external world being talked to by a desktop, which is a common kind of deployment scenario for people. Um, so that's the USB part. And then this part is really the major remains of the circuit, which is uh, an AppMega chip. Um, these things, this particular chip, it costs about, I guess, about 350 for most people with the Arduino operating system or bootloader on it. <coughs> Um, and then there's some protective components for power management and, and generally kind of protecting it from some kinds of spikes. Um, but in principle, this kind of chip or an equivalent to this chip, can, I can buy them for £1.10. So it's possible then to get all of the other supporting components to get something up and running and uh, be doing the job of a basic Arduino for about £1.70. Um, and then we have the USB part is a separate device, which is this thing, uh, which we can buy from China for about £1.65. Uh, the advantage of that being it's separable. You can pull it out off, and when, so you only might need it to program it once. An example of that is this persistent submission display. Um, this persistent submission display, which I, I could show you later, later on maybe, um, which draws in the air with some LEDs. Um, and most of the time you just need batteries on it. You don't need it to be attached to a laptop. So if you're working with a, a class of school children and they had 20 of these, you might only need one programmer between them in order to program all of their pops to update the message on it or something like that. So there's lots of options there in terms of cost. So um, I don't make money from selling the shrimp. Um, I don't own it. Anybody could try and get the bits together. If you go online, um, <laughs> so, the website, Shrimping It, uh, is extremely badly maintained by somebody, I don't know who it is. <laughs> uh, um, but an example link there is the recipe page or bill of materials for the bomb, this thing, which you'll see in a minute in more detail. Um, and basically it details who I buy everything from and at what cost um, to be able to identify all the parts if you wanted to source a hundred for a project or a class or something like that, just go ahead. Um, and uh, yeah, it's cheap stuff, really. <coughs> I've got a bunch today, as I mentioned. Uh, we'll get to that. So, um, let's do some programming first. I think we'll still have time to do a bill. So, um, what I have here is a Raspberry Pi with a shrimp attached to it. So it's a shrimp I soldered a bit earlier on. Um, you'll get a chance to build one pretty soon. Uh, but just so you, you can kind of see 
the logic of programming and how you might define uh, uh, behaviors in some way. So, this is configured, this Raspberry Pi is configured so that it connects to the network of my laptop. In other words, I've got internet sharing on this network port. Um, and on Ubuntu, that's fairly straightforward. <coughs> Um, you just are in your network configuration. Um, it's a wired network which has, uh, I can identify the, the range from which the addresses are being issued uh, by looking at the IP address that this adapter has 10.10.42.0.1. Um, it's then possible to, I'm just, this is all a bit real time, uh, so don't worry about this bit. Okay, so this is a command that I found from a web page, which I can, I can share with you at some point, um, <clears throat> which basically scans the network within a given range using a tool for network scanning called Nmap. Um, don't know what these do, I copy pasted it. And um, this is 10.10.42.0. and then the range 1 to 255. What it's going to do is it's going to scan, because uh, let's say I've just booted this, I've no idea. Uh, you know, I, I, I put a, a Raspbian image onto this SD card, I've connected it, that's as far as I've got. So at this point, I need to figure out what's the IP address of that uh, machine. And that scan will look for anything that's waiting on port 22, waiting for an SSH connection. And it will report back, um, probably my laptop and the Raspberry Pi. And then I'll have the IP address of the Raspberry Pi, and I can connect to it. So that kind of bypasses a lot of issues that people have with net, you know, installing wireless drivers or trying to configure their own network so that they can get that right. Um, this can be replicated on Windows and Mac as well, uh, and there's information online how to do it. The scan takes a long time, I don't know why, but eventually it just popped back uh, with some information. So um, given that I already know what the information is, um, so, I'll, uh, so what I'm doing here, this is uh, com Unix command line. Um, history just reports all of the commands that I've typed into the command line in recent history. Um, and then I'm piping it through a thing called grep, which is a regular expression parser. It's going to filter the result. Um, and then um, I'm using the, the term VNC to search for things that have VNC in it. So I can see what I did last time. It's much easier not to remember these things. Okay, so we got the result back from Nmap. Nmap says, okay, two hosts up. And it's found one at 10.42 North 25 and 10.42 North 1. Good. Okay, so that means that I should be able to type VNC viewer. Um, ah, no, let's just log in via SSH first. So SSH, this is from a, for a Pi straight from the factory with a Raspbian image on the SD card. Uh, pi at 10.42 North 25, hopefully. Okay, it's asking me for a password. The password, I just type it this thing, is by default Raspberry. There we go. <clears throat> um, and so there, I'm going to launch a VNC server, which, I, again, I've done before, so I'm just going to search for the command that I used, um, which is like <coughs> this. And again, it's just off of uh, a guide online. Um, I just completely copy pasted it. Um, so that's going to launch a, uh, a new desktop on here and wait for me to connect to it, um, which I can then connect to in my own machine. So VNC viewer. And 5901 is the port that it chooses by default. So that gives you a full address. The first part is the IP address that identifies the machine. The second part is identifying the service that I'm connecting to. Um, so with a bit of luck, I can then... Okay, uh, I'm in. So what we have here... <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so what we have here is a desktop environment. It's not unlike uh, any uh, typical Linux desktop environment, or not far off a Windows desktop environment. Um, so um, in particular, I'm just going to show you an interactive programming session using Python. 
Um, and Python is available again on all of the operating systems, and this kind of interaction is pretty straightforward on all of the operating systems. You might need to install particular libraries to do particular things with Python. Um, Python is a language which um, is very commonly available as a wrapper for tools that other people have built. So if there's something that originally was written in C, which is common for hardware things and media and uh, you know network drivers and all kinds of things, Python is often the sort of go-to language for people to just not have to write it in write in C when they use those tools because it's nasty uh, to, to write in C. I think <laughs> I try and avoid it. But, um, so. If we go straight for um, Python, so if you, assuming you've installed Python and Python Serial, this should all be straightforward. I'm also using a li library called PyFirmata, which I'll explain to you in a minute. Um, and on the other hat side of things, I'm going to be using uh, a tool called Gnoduino. Um, and in Gnoduino, it's Arduino, it's just a bit faster because uh, it doesn't use Java. Um, <coughs> And so if you, if you uh, are a bit more patient than me, you can just install Arduino. Um, the way that you'd install Arduino, which we could do in the background in a minute, um, is using a tool called apt-get. You just type apt-get install Arduino. It would install it automatically if it has a network connection. Okay, so what I'm using is a thing called Fermata. Fermata is right here. Um, this is a... Uh, a behavior that I can put onto the Arduino, or in this case, a shrimp, um, which just makes it remote controllable. It just makes it a slave that's waiting to hear what to do. And it just sits there, waiting, connected by this serial connection to uh, an expecting structured requests to come from the desktop, in this case, or sorry, the laptop in this case, um, <clears throat> and you'll see the results in seconds. So, um, to compile and um, upload to this device. Just hit the, uh, this arrow. This again is, is identical in Arduino. Uh, horizontal arrow to uh, uh, compile and upload the code. <coughs> um, this succeeding relies on a couple of different things. So first of all, you should be able to see a serial port in that list, uh, which is just, yeah, slowly down. <coughs> And there's a name there, dev TTY USB 0. That's a figure 0. That naming scheme is going to be different for Mac, different for Windows, different for Linux. Um, as long as you know what it is, it's important later on. So keep track of what that is. Um, and also, what board is it? If you're working with um, the shrimp chips that I'm distributing anyway, it looks like an Arduino Uno. It basically is the same as an Arduino Uno. It doesn't realise that it's had its brain sawn out and you know uh, been carried around in a jar. <laughs> so in the background, you can see that switch to the word flashing, and then finally flashing complete. So it was doing compiling for a long time because this is compiling on a Raspberry Pi, which is quite slow. Um, and then it said flashing, and then flashing complete. So that's good. And is it flashing? No. It's not flashing, it's not about the LED. Flashing is just a word for moving the program from in here, sorry, in here, <laughs> too many computers, in here uh, onto in here. Now remember what I'm doing with this view at the moment is my, my laptop is just a glorified screen, keyboard and mouse. It's doing nothing else, the Raspberry Pi is doing the work. <clears throat> so I've just put onto this trim uh, a remote control program. So what I should be able to do then, um, sorry, let's do this in Raspberry Pi world. Okay, so let's just get back out so you can see the whole thing. So from the command line, it has launched a terminal, which you can find here, accessories, Alex terminal is an example of a terminal. There are others. <coughs> you would get uh, something that looks a bit like that, just a dollar waiting for your input. So I'm going to type the word Python. <clears throat> because I didn't specify the name of a file, a Python file to run just here, Python something, it just goes, oh, you must want an interactive session then, which is what I do. <clears throat> um, I installed a library called PyFermata before, so I'm going to say from PyFermata import Arduino. 
Uh, right, so that's now telling the Python environment. Uh, can you see that? Is that too small? That's too small, isn't it? Um, okay, I need to make that bigger. What's a good number? Make it bold. 42. 80. 80. Okay. And make it bold, did you say? I'd say make it bold. Okay. Mm. Woo! That's better. Okay. Right. So, can everyone read that? I can go <coughs> There's not much to the code, after all. Um, so, first line. From Python R to import Arduino. Say, get me some Arduino goodness, please. Uh, using the farm Python R to library. And at this point, I'm going to um, use a, uh, well, I'll, I'll just teach you Python for about a minute, that's a good start. <clears throat> so, um, programming is all about some very simple concepts, really. One is something like values, so the number one, the number two, um, the word, Alan. Um, and so all I'm doing here is I'm telling the computer these values and the computer's giving them back to me. And, Computer's probably a bit confused. <laughs> um, but then, if you do something like one plus one, it starts to add up. Uh, excuse me. Um, uh, but equally well, you can have. Uh, this is never going to work, is it? Plus. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's not bad. Uh, we want to add a space in the middle. So we're going to add all of those together. So, you can do some manipulation with values, which will turn out to be useful later on. Um, but also, you can give the values names, and this is a key trick in programming. Programming is this interface between humans and, humans and computers, who don't understand each other, basically. Um, and so, if you can give things names, it's a good idea. <clears throat> so, you might say, well, I want to call um, the number one high. So, I'm going to assign it to a thing called high, uh, and uh, assign the number zero to a thing called low. Um, and then if I say, okay, well tell me what, what is low, zero, tell me what's high, and what's high plus low, well it's one plus zero, which is also one. Not this kind of thing you'd expect. So, <clears throat> um, what we're going to do, we've just imported Arduino, so I'm going to give, I'm going to create something with the name shrink, because that's going to be useful for me to refer to. I'm going to ask it to connect to an Arduino and the name of the device that we saw earlier on. <coughs> so that's now trying to connect to this uh, shrimp here um, and yeah, successfully connected. And now I can go, okay, so I'm going to use the name convenient to me, LED, um, and I'm going to use that to refer to the digital pin um, 13 out of all the digital pins on the shrimp. So now I've got something called LED for my convenience. And then I can go LED.write hi. Okay, so and in the context, because I redefined, I said I want to refer to uh, the number one as hi earlier on. Now, what I'm going to be able to use it for is to define the voltage that goes through that LED. So now when I hit enter, and pause, <laughs> okay. Um, and similarly, LED right uh, low. It's off again. Okay. So I have to check. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Python Marta has some. Well, Fermata has some very rich uh, capabilities that uses a lot of the rest of that mega chipset as well. Right now I'm just flashing the LED. You can control a servo using constant modulation. Um, you can communicate using I squared C, which is a, a way of talking between chip, uh, this chip and another chip. So you can use it in this kind of interactive way to explore what's possible and check that things work uh, before you write your great opus of code. <clears throat> and um, you can do that in, to quite a le level of detail. So what we've already got there is something that we just turned it on, we turned it off. So we also know um, from I uh, import sleep. So now uh, sleep one uh, should just wait for one second. 
So um, if I, <coughs> anyone remember Python? <laughs> uh, uh, flash. Yeah, I might. Yeah. Okay, so what I've done here is I've started to define a function called flash. So it's again, another way of using naming. What we saw before was giving values names. And this time we've, we're, we're seeing given a series of steps, so names. You saw some steps that I did before. Turn on the light, turn it off. So now we're going to give this collection of steps uh, a name. So <coughs> first of all, LED dot right I, then sleep one, then LED dot right low, then sleep one again. And then a blank line will tell it uh, I've finished defining that function. So that's very different from many other languages where you've got lots of brackets and semicolons and things like that to figure out. Python is a very clean syntax. Uh, it just uses new lines for each new step uh, and colons for collection, colons and indented code for collections of steps that you want to manipulate. So now we should hopefully see, huh, let's see, flash, okay, on for a second, off for a second. Uh, and then we should be able to uh, so now we've got a remote controlled version of uh, uh, a tutorial example from the Arduino uh, environment, which I'll show you in Arduino code in a second. Uh, but maybe we'll build some shrimps first. <coughs> so. Um, Basically, that's now going through that series of steps that is defined there. It's all via remote control from a, a, a Raspberry Pi through a connection to this, which is a cheap Arduino, which I refer to as a shrimp. Um, <clears throat> and um, we should build some and then do some Arduino programming. Okay. So, here's the build materials. You saw it on the website. Uh, in its current form, it looks like this. So, <laughs> what you need to do is I'm going to pass around these bags, down the chains, down the lines, and if you wish to make one, and I think there's enough for everyone, there's probably enough for everyone to make one, but we'll see, um, you need to grab this uh, bill of materials as you go. So three green wires, two red wires, one orange, yellow and brown wire each, 400, and, oh, sorry, 104, so you'll see a bag it's marked up as a 100 nanofarad capacitor, or 0 0.1 microfarad, which is the same thing. 0 0.1 micro, that's a mu letter, that's the same thing. Um, need four of them, two of the 22s, one of the 10, so anyway, I'm, I'm just reading it out. So, uh, and these are all available from CPC. <laughs> <laughs> I get these from Tader, as it turns out, apart from this, which I get from Mouser, so the chip itself I tend to buy from Mouser. When I get them from Mouser, I use this kind of a device, which I can put chips into uh, and uh, uh, flash them with the Arduino bootloader. It's a nice cheap way to go. Uh, the other modification that I need to do when I get things from China is these things don't have that extra pin soldered on when they arrive. I have to solder them on. So hopefully there are enough programmers for everyone to don't have problems with custom exercise duty, no? <laughs> uh, I have problems with them miscounting uh, sometimes. If it's under 15 pounds, there's no duty. Right, exactly. Um, I, I didn't mind paying customs excise duty, but they charged me 85% duty the last time. You go to my gift with a big cars, same way. Yeah, well, they misread the. You get the Chinese to my gift. Yeah, it doesn't help. They try a gift and you don't get any duty on gifts. Yeah. Are we Seriously recording this? this? Maybe not. <laughs> 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 In my case, I, I just wanted to pay the 20%. If you write prototyping as well, that's no duty either. Right, yeah. So there are valid, I'm sure, valid ways. <laughs> <for> small volume. <laughs> you were supposed to say $15, and they'd read, the decimal point was missing, so it looked like $1,500. <laughs> it, it isn't that. It's the fee that you get the processing lead. That, yeah, equally is a pain. It wasn't bad in this case, but. Um, that was from Taylor, anyway. Um, they're, they're very uh, reasonable pricing. Anyway, so what we'll start at with is breadboards, because why not? So, yeah, if you could 
sort of just go through various, the bags, they can go out in every direction, the bags have to go in a chain, really. Um, but yeah, if you want to, I was thinking if the thing to do, just making sure that everybody sees each bag in this one. Okay. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to vaguely listen to me at the same time as building your own kits. The bags should be going round. Uh, maybe we can start it actually. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you. Oh, wait, no, 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 the pins if you can avoid it because that's out of my own time basically. So be very careful when you start to spread more in a minute. Um, <laughs> Yeah. One LED. Uh, so the red wire. Uh, this is all wire. Uh, one LED is uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's just an LED. <laughs> 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 the trick is just make sure everybody sees it. That's all. Uh, it should be one end. That's it. One end. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Martin. <laughs> 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 I still have it written down. Yeah. 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 It's on the website. Yeah. So I'd love to get his picture. Yeah. 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 Still flashing. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh, that's oh, right. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Okay, so um, to entertain you as that is going on, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of a breadboard. Uh, and I'm going to use the camera, I think, to do that. So, hopefully, this will. You have to see this somewhat. Just a little tip when you get the bag, you might want to get out three components, say, for the three people sat near you to pass it on quickly. So, um, this is just to give you the authentic experience of provisioning your own circuits. It's not that I didn't have time to make them up in bags at all. <laughs> or more likely that they all went in Liverpool when I was at Four and four and four So this is a breadboard. Um, and from the front, it looks like that. That's what you can see. Um, and it has these horizontal rows, um, which are backed behind by a single piece of metal for each row. And that means that each component you shove through the holes at the front gets connected to any other thing shoved through in the same row. Because the little tin part, the little, the little metal part, grips the component that's been pushed through the hole from the other side. Um, and so this is a way of wi making a circuit, wiring things, without having to use solder. Which is why it's called a solderless wet breadboard. <laughs> The shrimp uh, design, if you can call it that, um, is basically a condensation of lots of people's knowledge, people like Simon out there on the um, Arduino forum, um, for how they tend to make circuits with an app mega with this chip. Um, and I just basically gathered as much knowledge as I could for the minimal 
uh, design that we could come up with. The principle of it is to use this organisational structure of the horizontal rows and not use the right hand or the left hand side rows at all. And the reason is that you're then in a position to use completely generic strip board to um, deploy a trip with no specialisation at all, which is the cheapest kind you can get. the same things they have to use and then go on a prototype is there yeah. and then they need to build a structure so that on I don't know if we're doing this, but I'm going to do something. Obviously, and this is throughout the session, when you feel like you've got an advantage for any reason, you kind of, you know something or you can help somebody, a neighbour with stuff, just get on with it, definitely. Um, and when you've got something working, you're the best qualified people to teach somebody at a similar knowledge level how to get their thing working. And if you type into Google uh, pin mapping, the first thing that comes up is the Arduino pin mapping because the Arduino is such a, a popular prototyping and hobby microcontroller platform. And what it will tell you is 
Um, more or less, if you have this chip outside of an Arduino, what is the logic of every part of it? So what's inside here is a load of transistors, a load of components that we could never fathom. Some people in the room probably can, I can't. Um, and what pops out of the sides, the silver bits, are functional features, things that you can do stuff with, things that you, can, you saw before, you can command to do something, like go high volts, go low volts. Um, the things that a, an electronics engineer would be referring to are a data sheet which would describe the pins in these terms. So in other words, that top left hand pin... Teachers, they're worse. Yeah. <laughs> um, you just let them know it's their own time they're wasting. <laughs> so... What you'll notice is this is given the number 1, and then 2, 3, 4, 5, then 14, and then 15 up to 28 on the other side. So that's the standard uh, numbering for this chip, which we'll try to refer to um, as much as possible. Uh, the Arduino numbering was convenient to, to their, the way they broke out their uh, pins, but has there's little relation, really, to the original numbering. Um, the upshot of that is that if you're using a circuit like this and you want to prototype an Arduino project, look at this diagram and go, oh, it says uh, Arduino digital pin 13. Oh, that's really pin 19. Fine. And then put, poke the wire in there. So this gives you a kind of um, a Rosetta Stone for translating between the actual chip in its raw form and Arduino names, these red ones down the outside. Those are the, the things that you'll see in Arduino code referring to uh, analog input 3, for example, will be in 26, this one here. The orientation of this is all determined by a little half moon that's cut out at the top. So the first thing we're going to do is put the chip in. Um, the chips, oh, hang on. The chips may or may not have had their legs bent yet. Okay, so the legs may be splaying further than they will go in to, uh, that, that will be easy to slide into the breadboard. So what you have to do is very carefully lay the chip on its side and just lean it towards the surface and you bend those legs just in a little bit until they're uh, right angle to the chip. Once they're a right angle to the chip, they'll slide straight into the breadboard and the position we're aiming for is to leave two holes at the top. Just two spaces uh, at the top. There you go, that's a better plan view. Uh, you notice from the uh, example breadboard before that there's a great big gap down the middle. Um, so the two sides of the microcontroller are not connected to each other. And so anything that you connect on one side is not connected to the other side. That would be important. <coughs> Oh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, the holders we won't be using today, that will be if you wanted to take them home put them on strip board, because that's a great way to solder them. But for breadboard, you just shove them into the, I don't, well, carefully shove them into the uh, breadboard. Um, can I grab a... Alan, can I steal your kit? Is that feasible? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Uh, one beat. Four point one beat. Uh, there should be a mic. No, a microphone. Yeah. Four. That's a hundred dollar. Oh, I see. Okay. So what we have is uh, a chip into which we're going to stick a load of what? Sorry, a breadboard with the chip position. We're going to stick a load of wires in relative to the chip. So the first wire that goes in is a red wire, sorry, brown wire, which is going to go into the row just above pin one on the pin mapping. So that is to say, on the left hand side, with the little half moon symbol at the top, you should have the brown wire above the chip in an empty row. Have you said what the prize is? For, we're playing for a line to begin with in a full house. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell them that the notch is the top? Yes, half moon. Sorry, I was saying half moon, but it's a notch. Yes. Can we do it like battleships? Because they've got 
Oh, they've had, they've, all the boys don't. That's a different boys, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes. No notch on these, it's a circle pin, num pin number one. Yeah, I described um, a half moon at the top. So there's a half moon at the top, and pin number one is just to the left. Yeah. Sorry, I was showing the diagram earlier on, but we can refer back to it. So this is the top of the chip, half moon cut out, and that's pin number one there. This brown wire that we're putting in is going in the row above. <laughs> Just to start, we'll get the pace up pretty soon. <laughs> okay, and then uh, we're going to put the yellow wire into pin number two. That's pin number two on the chip. And that's row number four if you're looking at the red one that has numbers on it. But they don't, I think, today have numbers on it. <coughs> Next one is orange. Um, I tend to bend them at a right angle and I bend them where the insulation is because it tends not to break the wire in half that way because the bend isn't quite so sharp. Um, so um, that's going immediately below yellow. And then we're going to put in red next. We then reach for the crystal, which is the silver thing. It looks a bit like a French toilet. Uh, you can imagine the little doors on the side there. Um, and as you approach it, and, and you can probably get trapped in it afterwards. So the item looks like a silver French toilet. You put into uh, two rows just below the green wire that you've already put in. So I'm putting it in as a diagonal, it's the only way to do it. So you've got one pin in the row immediately below green, and the next pin in the row below that. Can we have good references, Ken? Uh, well, rel relative to the chip, it's 11 and 12. So if you count from number one being the top left-hand pin of the chip, then the crystal goes into number 11 and 12. So the crystal, if you think of this whole system as being like a kind of clockwork mechanism, the crystal is like the pendulum. It ticks along, and it ticks along at 16 million times a second. It's pretty fast. I'll just put that in, I'll perhaps tell you in a second. So, um, I've just put in a 104, it's a, a capacitor that's marked 104, it's a 100 nanofarad capacitor. And it's going between the brown wire and the first pin chip. So the row, it's got the brown wire in, should have one of the legs of the cap and the capacitor in it. And the row that's got the first pin of the chip in. Why are they not? Is that a built-in Christmas? Okay. There is. You need to flash them different fuses in order to explain that. Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.
you can you can get it, you can say me and I've got the bag there as well. So just to talk you through what a capacitor does, and that'll be relevant later as well. A capacitor is a way of storing charge. So as an electrical feature, it provides a means of um, smoothing out bumps in a power signal that is coming into the chip. Uh, the full circuit, the full shrimp circuit, has quite a lot of capacitors in it. What the building is just a bare minimum today. This minimal circuit is capable of doing quite a lot and doing a lot of digital stuff. If you want stuff that controls motors and does a lot of analog stuff, you'll need to add more components. So I'll show you that on the website. Um, if you're on the front page of the website, there's a whole load of um, diagrams of the base here. And to talk you through them, roughly speaking, this is where we're headed today. It's going to be a very minimal circuit, just enough to give the app mega chip life. A more detailed circuit is like this. Actually, I just scrolled it out of view, but there's, there's some components up here. Most of the extra components just capacitors, which help to protect the circuit from spikes from the outside world. Um, there's also some wires that are connecting some other pins that would also like to have power and ground but which we don't need today. Power being 5 volts and ground being 0 volts. Yeah. So if you move forward with this kit, and part of the reason you've got so many components, most of which you won't use, yeah. uh, you've got the big lot. Um, and that means that you can all bag them for me at the end. <laughs> um, that means that if you do take it away, you'll have a full kit that you can build and deploy in, in the field, hopefully. So, Let's go back to So, we've already got, hopefully, um, a capacitor added. Um, we're also going to find a 10 kilohertz, uh, kilo ohm resistor. Um, that's going to be used as a pull-up resistor, which is to say it needs to be attached to up to high, 5 volts. Um, so we're going to push it into the row that's got the red wire in it. So there should be now a resistor sticking out of your uh, row with the red wire. The colours uh, indicate the uh, the amount of resistance. It's the one with an orange bar to save you time. But, um, each of the colours represents a single digit in the description of the resistance value. Um, where the, the first digits are, for example, the uh, the 10 or the happy user. Well, it's an exponential <laughs> if you're into scientific notation. Um, you describe the first two significant figures and then the multiplier in terms of powers of 10. And so uh, I'm going to give up on that right now. But look it up if you need to. They're numbers, even though they look like colours. Um, and so the, the other end is going to go into uh, pin number one. Push that blooming cap in the wrong place, is not it? It's in the backwards. Hang on. Um, okay. So, that, the other end of that leg is going to go into pin one. It's a pull up resistor. Pull up resistor. Which is the first one going? Sorry, the first one goes into um, red, which is high volts. So, the red should be. Counting from the top left hand corner, red should be in number seven. And the resistor should come out of red. The resistor should come out of red and go into pin number one. So it should go out of pin number seven on the chip and into pin number one on the chip. So the pull-up resistor, what that's doing is ensuring that that pin will register a high voltage unless something gets into the business of attaching it to ground. So in other words, it can sense when somebody attaches it to ground. In the full circuit that you'll see, there's a button there uh, which attaches it to ground when you push the button. So it's a way of rebooting the computer, uh, the little computer on this chip. Uh, in our case, we're going to be programming it. So we're going to get a reset signal coming along the brown wire through the capacitor, and that's going to drag down the uh, signal. 
uh, drag down and pin number one. And of course it's a reset. The Arduino bootloader, the way it, it, it thinks, uh, is such that um, it, when it's reset, it waits for a little bit to see if you're sending it a new program. <clears throat> so, then the last thing is to put a uh, an LED in place. So, the LED is going to go into digital pin 13. So, we are going, that's counting from bottom left, it's actually pin 19, and bottom left is 15, so 15, 16, 17, 18, 9. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Oh, yeah. Where, where are they? Yeah, there we go. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. So the long leg of the LED is going into pin nineteen, and the short leg can go into a row just below. Bit of a That's a good scheme. Let's do that. That's probably the right scheme. If I get out of the. There we go. That's better. So the long leg goes into pin 19, and the bottom left pin is 15. The short leg goes into an empty row just below the chip. And then we're going to close the connection on the LED by attaching the sh by connecting the short leg using the other resistor that you've got, which is a 100 ohm resistor, back to ground. So that's going to connect the LED up finally. Ground being green in this case. So you should both the short leg of the LED and the other end of the resistor should be in an empty row just below the jet. And the other end of the resistor is going into green. It should only have two, hopefully, but um, it's a 100 ohm resistor. It doesn't have orange on it. Yeah. I'll just introduce you and leave the seat. So, um, in principle, um, we are now done and we have built a computer that we can tell to flash a light, which we'll see in a second. Um, so, I'll let people who, who need a little bit more time to figure it out uh, to look at a copy of. Yeah, so, before we move on to our next phase, that Kevin's going to lead us through, we're just having a point where we stop and we reflect on, on, on what we've done. There was um, an interest, I'm not sponsored by PC Pro Magazine, by the way, or CPC, but there was an interesting article I was reading this morning in the, CP, sorry, in the PC Pro Magazine, and they were talking about... <laughs> They're all merging, yeah. They were talking about how um, these sort of green environmental directives and about how um, basically how it's, it's better if equipment can be breaking down, can be taken apart afterwards for recycling. And I was saying about how things like the Retina MacBook and how it now, because all the parts are all glued together because it's easy to manufacture, but for example, if you ever need to replace an SSD or something like that, you literally have to destroy the laptop in, in order to get inside it. And I suppose it's, it's part of the culture that we live in now that we very rarely, or at least our children, very rarely get to see these kind of things. You know, they'll use a device like this without thinking that this microcontroller here, well, there's going to be a version of a microcontroller in there that controls when the shutter opens and closes. So the reason why Kevin's doing some place on a Raspberry Jam, I think, is totally, totally pertinent because 
what the Raspberry Pi is trying to do is it's trying to unveil, uh, sorry, reveal or unleash that technology so people can see what it looks like on the inside. And that's the same thing that's going on here. So the first question really was, in your discussions, you're supposed to be talking about how could you use this for a project? And we'd like to hear now. So, because this is actually part of Kevin's research and his work at the moment is all about this. So, so somebody be bold enough. Tim. Yeah. Well, I've got the idea for some of my classes for building Arduino based robots, which is great for the class, but I've kind of got the same problem. Like, it's great for them to build it, but the problem ends up you're building an exact carbon copy of the same thing that they get to play with for an hour and then put back again. But I reckon using this, we could build relatively cheap robots, around 15 quid we've got to at the moment, that actually the kids could give a bit of money to, and actually take the robot away and reprogram and tweak it and develop it even further. And, and, and so you, ownership also there is a key point, because if, we, if we're talking about three pounds for something like this, whereas an Arduino, they're still around like the 20-pound price mark, aren't they? So you, straight away you're saving 17 pounds on the cost of something, but you're saying, but not only that, but you can then branch off in lots of different directions yeah. rather than really focus on the same thing. They can afford to bespoke it, I guess. In the, yeah. They're kind of disposable in a way. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, and that's, I think that's also true of comparing uh, pre-made projects. I've, I've been asked to look into uh, running soldering workshops for a mini pop recently. And I'm so sort of disappointed. What part is Sorry, uh, pers yeah. persistence of vision, which I could show you in a minute. Uh, it is flashing LEDs, and the persistence of vision means that when they flash across your retinas, you see a whole image uh, that was sort of painted onto your retinas by the bright light as it travelled across, as you wave it basically, and then it makes a picture or text or what have you. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, the, the Lady Ada uh, uh, kits that you get are essentially not programmable for anything else. You can change the text on it, although that's itself fairly hard to do. Um, and that's that. So if you decided you wanted to do something else with it, uh, you can't. Uh, it comes already programmed from the factory, even though it's a pre-programmable microcontroller. And that's, it just seems disappointing. So I put together recently a POV uh, design based on the shrimp, which has got, I think, two solder joints more than the uh, Ada, Fru Ada Fruit Mini POV. Um, and costs a fraction of the same uh, the price. So hopefully that, that is another uh, classroom project. I just have this opinion in the room. Who would, who would class this thing as being a computer? Who would say that once what you've built now is a computer? Hands up if you believe it's a computer that you've got. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Hands up if you don't believe it's a computer. Okay, so just two people who are saying so. Dawn, what, what, why, why are you you're saying this is not a computer? I'm going to be perfectly honest with you here. All I've done tonight is follow a set of instructions. Yes. The components actually go up. It's a long while since I've touched... A breadboard. Um, a breadboard, yeah. And the components don't mean anything to me. I'm sorry if that makes me look stupid, but I'm just being honest. No, you no, know, it, it's it, good to raise that. It right. doesn't. It doesn't mean anything to me. At the moment, it's going to be you're following a pattern. Yeah. And until there's that magical moment, you go, Ah, oh, now I get it. Yeah. yeah. But but how does that change your opinion about whether it's a computer or not? Well, it doesn't at the moment because I'd have to see it plugged into something and that's. So. So you're saying for it, for it to be a computer, you have to see it plugged in? Or well, see it doing something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And there's yeah. gentlemen yeah. here as well, also, yeah. Yeah. you argue it's not a computer because... It's like a controller, actually. So a microcontroller is not a computer because... It's a subset of a computer. It's a um, part of a computer. You can actually um, drive an old video display using the Atmos. There's a lot of projects on them to actually do things like Pong and... Even games, text displays yeah, yeah. using this, yeah. there's a little yeah. video game system you can do. So that. does that make it a computer? You can say oh, a switch is a computer. You can say a switch is a computer. No, it's not. It's obviously a transistor. It's got more than one transistor and you can write programs for it. So you're saying if it's if you can write programs for it, therefore yeah. it's a computer. It's yeah. offer. It, it's a computer even if you can't write programs for it. Is it capable of making decisions? Is it capable of performing logical operations? Mathematical yeah. operations. Yeah. Is it capable of storing instructions on there? Yeah. So would that make it a computer then? Yeah. By some definition. Okay. So by some definition, this is a computer. So it's a bit more powerful than the ZX81. <laughs> 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 ZX81 isn't a computer. Hey, don't you go dissing ZX81s? To an extent, it's 
can argue that within a few moments you have failed, <laughs> you have failed the computer. But some people might say, well, no, actually, because the computer is there on the IC. The ADI, the ADI is one of the better microcontrollers, controllers, better than the pictures of the price. So it's a lot better than the Right, which is wrap these up. So, so Tim said you could build a project around this, but because you don't use the standard Arduino platform, it opens out in lots more areas. Come on. Any other ideas that people have had for projects? When you were in your discussions, how else could you use this for a project? We use them uh, to control servos, so just a 20 millisecond pulse to either scan uh, with an ultrasonic transducer or um, they use them at the Granada Studios, so where they had Sherlock Holmes and the eyes were following you around. So, you had a remote. Like animatronics, you could have like robot, robotic type projects. Anthony? Yeah. You could use them as a smart fire replacement for your TV thing you get for Sky. <laughs> but we're not going to mention it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. I'm not sure if that's what we should be teaching children. Let them discover that themselves. And the second thing, right, Kevin's been, yeah. Kevin's been marvellous taken through this step by step, but what kind of feedback advice can we give them? How could he have made this easier for us or more successful? I, think I, I have the, the diagram on the website, which I think is a brilliant little diagram. It's brilliant. You put that in the class, it'd be really good if you could have that step by step. So just yes. the chip, then one form, then yeah. two, then three. Mm. And I think. If you do it with the kids, if you do it with the kids, you look at that and they'll just go and panic when they see it. Yeah. But if you do it nice step by step, I've added that, I've added that. Yeah. You can count the pins and work out where yeah. they go. Yeah. So I'm halfway through doing that with filler activities. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm relying on Ben to send it to me. So oh, I'm <laughs> halfway through because I figured they do two steps and they all need to check each other's done it right. You need to walk around and check them all. So I'm putting like a little filler activity in every so often as well. Yeah. yeah, that'll be. Yeah. So, if, if you imagine it wasn't Kevin, it was Jamie Oliver that we're watching, and Jamie Oliver does this demonstration, and you watch it, and you think, wow, that looks incredible. But at the end of the day, you still need that recipe that people can go back and refer to and try themselves at their own pace. So, and just one more suggestion, maybe. Could you print the actual um, component layout on a sheet of paper and over put it over the, uh, the uh, breadboard? So you, you say the layout or the actual the ingredients, the list of ingredients? No, the, the layout of the components, if you put that on a piece of paper, yeah. and they actually put the components... Ah, an overlay, yeah. 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 So yeah. it's yeah. like a paper overlay that goes yeah. over the top. Yeah. There, is, there is an alternative method as well where you, you have grid coordinates. Some of the breadboards you might have noticed have quite prominently got numbers and letters down the side, so you can say like... H1, G2, almost like battleships where you've got coordinates. But right, back to Kevin. There, there is an element where it is teaching. There is an element where you have to do that. So just like programming computer, you have to. There is a sort of a role. I want you to follow this. Well, I mean, I'm building it, but I don't know. Yeah, it's, you've not done So. That's the sort of, what you're missing is the whole picture. You're not getting the big picture. You've built this thing, you sat there wondering, what is it going to do? And I can answer that question, which is, this is just, essentially, at the moment, this is just going to make an LED go on or off at either patterns or intervals or whatever. But then that could lead on to other things like motors, like switches. It's a first step. Yeah. Yeah, all right. <laughs> But, yeah, but I suppose what you're saying is you, you, you're on a journey, you don't know which part of the journey you're on, you don't see at the end, at the beginning, you don't see how it fits into the whole thing. That's really valid. Oh, the information is on that strength thing. Strength thing. Oh, yes, that's right. So, um, it's, it's great to get feedback, um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to get some later on as well if people are joining us uh, later on in the pub. Uh, but happy to just stop afterwards if people aren't going on there. Um, and it's very early days what we're doing here, uh, as you probably gathered. It's a bit chaotic. Um, and, but what, what the, the, the things that I'm hearing from, from Dawn and from yourself, what's your name? Keith. Keith. Is exactly, in some ways, the thing I'm hoping people will feel. Which is to say, a lot, a lot of the people that are working in this, I say working, right? 
hobbyists as well, and people just having fun, and people like me that are helping people have fun, but also making some money, building things for people sometimes. Um, we're mostly lost. <laughs> um, we mostly figure it out by looking at somebody who is just that tiny bit more expert, or has done something sufficiently similar, and we go, okay, let's just completely duplicate what they did, with pretty well no knowledge at all, and then prove that we can do what they did, and then go, right, now I'm going to twist it in the way that I want to. I'm going to pull that out and put this in instead, and so on. So it, it is about ignorance in some ways, and it's about coping with ignorance, and, and coping with the fact that these are mysterious components. And I should reveal, Dawn, that your circuit worked first time. So you obviously know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, um, so let me give you some examples. We'll hopefully get a chance to test everybody. Um, but I'll, I'll uh, show you some examples um, from uh, this list. Why not? Because this is a list that I prepared for our lady as well. So which of these subjects are people interested in or capture people's uh, imagination? Lasers. Lasers. Okay. So let's, uh, let's find that. Let me just... Sorry, switching too many times. So Kevin's like the Arduino DJ. You can just basically, um, you can ask him if he's got any Billy Joel or uh, Michael Jackson, and, and he'll have somewhere he'll have a video of a project built around that theme. Built around Michael Jackson. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Have you not seen his moon dance in Arduino? No, this is an example. I don't know what's it's, it's a real thriller, like. honestly. Oh. Oh. Oh, yeah. So I think that's laser pens, possibly. I know he's found some way of getting a load of lasers anyway, and moving some mirrors probably with servos. And then he's got a thing that just detects when his hand is in there. And you can detect them, you can see it yourself. It's a very bright light when your hand is in the way, which isn't there when your hand isn't in the way. And then he's connected it up to a synthesizer. So, you know, in terms of complexity, this is sort of a somewhat complex project because you need to figure out each of those stages. But it's not that complex in that when it sees the light, it goes, it hits the note. And when it doesn't, it doesn't. So the logic of it is very similar to what we're looking at today. Um, just light to light, play a, uh, play a tone, so on. So, other examples that people might uh, be interested in from this list. Anything else? Dresses. 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 <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so this is um, a fluid dress that's woven together from transparent uh, tube with a UV uh, responsive liquid that's pumped around uh, under the control of an Arduino uh, circuit. So that's just a, a way of creating an amazing kind of uh, party dress, essentially, that you can walk around with. Portable pack, battery pack uh, to, to drive the whole thing. The so, bad news is it's not uh, machine washable. It has to drive <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little revealing. I don't know what you're supposed to uh, wear underneath it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's what you're uh, another one. No. Drinking. Drinking. Okay. Um, so, I mean, this might mean. I think this is important for people to see the kink, kinds of things that you can build. And, uh, so, we might not get through all the circuits testing them, but, um, you know, what, what gets built is dependent on you and it's the direction you take it. But there's almost anything that you can type into uh, Google, like this is Arduino and drinking, right? You type in Arduino and drinking, you'll probably find this. If that's your hobby, I don't know. <laughs> but again, relatively simple. You've got something at the end which is turning a little um, uh, uh, screw that moves the thing along, and then you've got something that moves the, uh, the glass up enough to trigger the octet. Uh, not a lot of complexity, but it creates the experience that person wanted. So that laser harp is still going. <laughs> How is that still going? Uh, somewhere is a laser heart. I can't find it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so that's just some examples I can show you more. There's there's lots of crazy things out there. And literally, uh, let's just try this just for seeing the pants, why not? So 
Think of any any hobby. Who's shout, some, shout all your hobbies, and I'll try and pick up some. Archery. MMA. MMA. <laughs> 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 How robust is the Arduino then? Stamp collecting, Stamp archery, collecting. Uh, archery, okay, so let's try archery, uh, I don't know, Arduino, right, literally, just, uh, what, what have they built? Oh, a, a pop-up target system, okay, so they wanted to be able to have something which would control the appearance of bad guys, so you could aim, uh, I mean, I imagine, uh, so you could aim arrows at them, why not? You know, it's again, it's a thing that you decide to do, and then you build, and why not? It's not that hard. So, um, so exactly what you turn out and want to build, it's a matter of grabbing people like Simon, grabbing people like myself, as well as people in the room, uh, figuring out what are the stages you need to get through to get to where you want to get to, uh, what tools you might need, see what bits are in the box that you can just take, and so on, and then build your automated uh, archery murdering device. So, um, this is a demonstration of a working circuit. I'm sure many of your circuits are working. Uh, we can prove that ourselves. This is Dawn's. Literally, I just plugged it in and fired it up. And I programmed it from the Raspberry Pi as well, which takes a little time. So, uh, next time, I'm going to program them from the desktop. Um, <coughs> But uh, yeah, if you have your device around, hopefully uh, I can take your device, plug it in, and it will just program straight away. So is there anything we can plug to where? Uh, okay, so the relationship. Kevin, okay, are there other people in the room who can help relieve the bottom there? Say again. Are there other people in the room who can help them test? Yes, uh, I'm going to just show a uh, copy of it, and then you can see. Uh, what the colour sequence should be. So what you should see is that kind of thing. You should see nothing at all. Can you see any colours? Yeah. Brown is yeah. Brown is onto the, the extra pin that's sort of stuck on the side. So this one is marked GND, it's a bit blurry. And then there's T TXD, RFC, 5 volts. So 5 volts is red. GND, which is 0 volts, is green. And the other cables are just in a row in between them. They should be aligned exactly with the wires. So it should be green at GND and then red at 5 volts with the brown wire peeling off to connect to the pin that's halfway up. Fingers crossed. So, you might have one. What's your name? Damien. Damien, right then. Look. Looking positive. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to use I'm using the Arduino IDE here. Um, and it's going to be quicker to compile on my big stack computer than. So, checking serial port is there, yeah, the board is Arduino Uno, so everything should be clear. <laughs> and Damien, I think you've got a result. <coughs> Blinking, okay. So, you notice that this code is pretty well identical, well, it is identical in function to the last code. The difference is this is now C. You can see that the groups of steps, so this is a step here, says make pin 13 and output. You saw the names of pins before. Um, and then Luke is saying, write a high voltage to digital 13, and then wait a thousand milliseconds. Then write a low voltage to digital 13, then wait a thousand milliseconds. So there's one step there and four steps there. And each of those is given a name. And this, this group of steps, there's only one in it, this group of steps is given a name setup. It's run once when you give the circuit power. This 
group of sets is run over and over again, suggested by the name loop. It just keeps running over and over and over again. So your circuit at this point, if I unplug it, it's not reliant on. Oh, where's the um, the Simon game got to, by the way? Where my battery is. Oh, uh, can I grab a Simon game? Thank you. I need the battery, really. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So this is a Simon game. An example of something we're doing with Trimpy. As you can see, it might still be working. So if I reset the Simon game, it basically um, teaches you to um, uh, play a sequence of. <laughs> so try again. You probably remember Simon game from the 1870s, I do anyway. Um, so that's a completely self-contained program. The only difference is it's got four LEDs, uh, it's got four buttons soldered on the bottom, and a beeper. So that's the only difference, really, with the circuit that you just got. Where's the Damien circuit? Here it is. So if I unplug this... So this is this just proves that Damien's um, circuit is actually battery operated. It's running off of three uh, double A's here um, with a completely self-contained program on it. Um, it's just, so you can take the power in through, through, through straight from a battery and it works just the same. Okay, anyone else have one to try? So we're seeing compiling 